Joseph Soloveitchik, The Lonely Man of Faith. In this lecture, we consider the nature of human existence as set out by Joseph Soloveitchik in The Lonely Man of Faith. This work, first published in 1965, speaks to the intersection of Western philosophy and rabbinical learning at the heart of Soloveitchik's thinking. He was equally learned in both Jewish orthodoxy and modern philosophy. Keep this in mind as you read the work. Does The Lonely Man of Faith offer a universal vision of human existence, one that speaks to all peoples, even as it draws upon Jewish ideas? Or is Soloveitchik trying to make orthodoxy compelling for the modern Jew? Is he writing as a modern philosopher or as a traditional scholar of the Torah? Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, affectionately known as the Rav, the teacher, was born in 1903 in what is today Belarus into a family renowned for its rabbinical learning. He received a traditional training in Torah in his family home, but also studied modern philosophy at university in Berlin, where he received his doctorate in 1932. Soon thereafter, he emigrated to the United States to settle in Boston, Massachusetts. In America, he became a founding father of what is known as modern orthodoxy, a trend within contemporary Judaism that seeks to root Jews in the orthodox tradition and also provide them with knowledge of modern thought, not to assimilate, but to be able to maneuver confidently through contemporary realities. For example, Soloveitchik defended the traditional practice of separating men and women in synagogue, but he was also instrumental in opening the doors of Torah study to women no less than men. Soloveitchik was also a communal leader no less than a paramount scholar. He founded the Maimonides Day School in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1937, and in 1941 became head of the rabbinical seminary at Yeshiva University in New York City. Even after his death in 1993, he continues to exert influence through his many students whom he trained and ordained as rabbis. It is important to locate Soloveitchik's thought within the trajectory of modern Jewish philosophy. Through the ages, there have always been Jews who took up the study of philosophy. One might mention Philo the Jew of Alexandria in the first century, learned in the thought of Plato. And of course, one has to mention Maimonides, born in Cordoba in the 12th century, learned in the thought of Aristotle. However, while philosophy can be enlisted to support a monotheistic conception of God, it can also pose a challenge to traditional religious teachings, for example, teachings on miracles, and it can also challenge the very notion of prayer. Does it really matter? Does it really have any effect? Modern philosophy has been especially threatening in this sense, and perhaps particularly so to Judaism, which in its traditional form can appear as a bundle of obscure rituals and practices. In general, modern philosophy saw traditional religion as infantilizing, with all its do's and don'ts, and all its arcane practices. One was to be liberated from traditional teachings in order to think critically about empirical reality apart from all such mumbo-jumbo. One of the seminal figures of modern philosophy, a thinker from the 17th century by the name of Baruch Spinoza, was born a Jew, but claimed that the legal heritage of Judaism, known as Halakha, stifled rationality and independent thinking. In his view, the laws of Judaism worked to cultivate a slave mentality. He was essentially calling his people to get over the authority of traditional religion and to heed the dictates of rationality as true authority. Immanuel Kant, the 18th century German philosopher, argued that man is to make his own laws. In Kant's view, religion is a system of rationally comprehensible ethics, not something mysterious beyond what the human mind can grasp. For Kant, man is to be guided by his own rationality, not by a set of commands and prohibitions purportedly revealed from on high. Kant's ideas raised all sorts of questions about the relation of God to humanity. If man can make his own laws, what is the point of God? Indeed, Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the progenitors of modern atheism, took things in this very direction. If man is morally autonomous and does not need revelation to be guided, then why not give up the idea of God altogether? In other words, man has the capacity to be his own master, the ubermensch, the superhuman. For Nietzsche, those who believe in God are not masters of themselves, they are slaves. Of course, Nietzsche's was only one expression of the modern idea of man as ethically self-sufficient. Another response came from Soren Kierkegaard, Danish philosopher of the 19th century. A pious Christian, Kierkegaard, or SK as he is known, was still a product of his time. He seems to have accepted the claims of modern philosophy that would make God objectively unknowable and thus potentially irrelevant to public life in modern society. After all, what's the public utility of something you can't test in a laboratory? Such can be the empiricist mindset of modernity. Kierkegaard was therefore led to advance the idea of faith as a subjective experience, the leap of faith, as opposed to the idea of religion as a rationally determinable, 
objective order of ethics, apart from particular religious teachings, as advanced by Kant, and after him, Kant's younger contemporary, George Hegel. Given the modernizing intellectual climate of his day, Kierkegaard, to preserve a place for faith in human existence, was compelled to elevate the subjective experience of the individual believer, whom he called the Knight of Faith, over and above modernist claims to be able to determine an objective system of ethics through the power of the mind alone. Amidst all these developments, many Jewish communities continued to live traditional lifestyles, but there were Jewish intellectuals who sought to engage modern philosophy and negotiate a space for Judaism within it. Among the luminaries of modern Jewish philosophy, we can mention names such as Hermann Cohen, Franz Rosenzweig, Emmanuel Levinas, and Jacques Derrida. Our author, Joseph B. Soloveitchik, the Rav, stands within this trajectory. His ideas represent a unique and particularly orthodox voice within modern Jewish philosophy. This can be seen in a work written by Soloveitchik in 1944 entitled Halachic Man. In it, he shows that the Jew, who lives according to the legal heritage of Judaism, Halacha, is not at all backwards, but actually has a central place in the modern world. Those who live by Torah are not otherworldly and atavistic. In contrast to spiritual enthusiasts eager to transcend the world to be with God, the Jew, according to Soloveitchik, is wholly grounded in this world rather than the world to come. And this is in fact due to his Judaism, not in spite of it. Indeed, Judaism, in the sense advanced by the Rav and Halachic man, is not about unknown mysteries, but rather about living ethically in this world. The Jew is thus like the mathematician or scientist who seeks to make sense of this world, the difference being that the Jew, while accepting mathematical and scientific explanations of worldly realities, also seeks to understand the ethics of this world. In this sense, rabbinical scholars are cast as powerful legal minds that imbue this world with spiritual energy as they joyfully uncover the logical coherence of the vast corpus of halachic teachings. This makes them the intellectual equals of mathematicians, scientists, and modern philosophers. Their devotion to learning is not an obscure undertaking rooted in inscrutable texts of pre-modern thinking, as if Judaism were a cacophony of irrational and irreconcilable rulings, Rather, rabbinical learning exists for ethical purposes, making its goal akin to that of philosophy. Just as for philosophy the goal of pursuing knowledge is a life of virtue, so too is it the goal of Torah study. In this way, the Rav contends that Judaism is not alien to modern philosophy. Also, to counter Spinoza's idea of halakha as something that enslaves the Jewish mind, Soloveitchik argues that Judaism is chiefly about partaking in the ethical creativity of the halakhic community. It is not about conformity to an external authority called God. Rather, to be a Jew is to take on God's role by bringing into being an ethical world. Judaism is thus not at all infantilizing, but quite the opposite. In Echo of Kant, Judaism here becomes the fullest expression of human dignity, namely the capacity to be morally autonomous. In sum, halachic man is a spiritually invigorated, ethically autonomous, joyfully this worldly religious hero. It needs to be said that Soloveitchik's reformulation of the traditional meaning of halakha has generated a good deal of controversy that continues to this day, notably among more mystically minded Jews who feel he cut out of Judaism its rich spiritual teachings, and that he did so, in their view, in order to compromise with modernity and provide Jews with a way to be Jewish and also at home in modern America, at the cost of their own spiritual heritage. Nevertheless, Soloveitchik's ideas left a powerful impact on American Judaism, inspiring many Jews to take up the study of Torah. Characteristic of his thinking in Halakhic Man is his reflection on the concept of repentance in Judaism. It is not, he argues, something that renders one servile to an external will to which one penitently submits. On the contrary, repentance is empowering, an experience of self-renewal and self-creation that flows from the call of Judaism to live by human willpower. Here, Soloveitchik pushes back against Nietzsche's dismissal of traditional religious practice as a hindrance to the glory of the human will. In Halachic Man, Soloveitchik has this to say, Judaism declares that man stands at the crossroads and wonders about the path he shall take. Before him there is an awesome alternative, the image of God or the beast of prey, the crown of creation or the bogey of existence, the noblest of creatures or a degenerate creature, the image of the man of God or the profile of Nietzsche's Superman, and it is up to man to decide and choose. Herein is embodied the entire task of creation and the obligation to participate in the renewal of the cosmos. The most fundamental principle of all of this is that man must create himself. It is this idea that Judaism introduced into the world.
The lonely man of faith is very much the climax of Soloveitchik's thinking on what it means to be human. He accepts modern assumptions, but also critiques them. He agrees. To be human is to be productive in a modern sense where one seeks to harness the forces of nature for the improvement of man. But he also offers further perspective that is foreign to the modern mindset. To be human is to be lonely in a deeply existential sense. Judaism, he suggests, speaks to both sides of human existence. The human creature is endowed with a divine intelligence to partake in the work of creating the world. This is to affirm modern assumptions about the human being in Jewish terms. At the same time, Soloveitchik critiques modernity for being blind to another side of existence, the fact that human beings are essentially lonely, leading them to seek out communion with others. But this communion that humans seek is not based on worldly interest. It comes rather from the recognition that there is something greater than oneself, namely God, before whom one is to stand in prayer alongside others. Indeed, for Soloveitchik, to pray means simply to stand before God with this sense of acknowledging the insecurity of one's own existence. Remarkably, Soloveitchik starts from existential loneliness as the fundamental condition of being human and ends with a claim that to be human means to live not simply as productive citizens of a modern state, but in community with God. To be human is, then, to be part of a praying community. Soloveitchik affirms both creativity and loneliness as part of the human condition. He looks to the two narrations of the creation of man in the book of Genesis, which, he argues, speak to the two sides of being human. He refers to them as Adam the first and Adam the second. He ties Adam the first to the story of the creation of man in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. There, it says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He then told them to be fruitful and multiply and also to fill the earth and subdue it and to have dominion over all other creatures. Thus, according to this description, the human is born as a social creature. Adam is not created alone. Adam and Eve, man and woman, are created together. Male and female, he created them. However, as Soloveitchik explains, this kind of sociality is about partnering for the sake of productivity and the fulfillment of worldly interests. Here, God created Adam to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Adam the first speaks to the side of humanity that comes together in order to improve its lot, to advance technology, develop effective means of transport, eradicate poverty and disease, in short, to conquer the world for the improvement of the human condition. Soloveitchik refers to this side of humanity as the majestic community. Adam the first is all about the glory of the human being, created in the image of God and thus able to imitate the creative power of God by bringing modern society into being. Adam first is the go-getter, workaholic, professional who enthusiastically joins with others to achieve common purposes and make the world a better place. And yet despite all his success, Adam the first, the archetype of modern man, is lonely. To be lonely is not to be alone. Indeed, Adam the first is surrounded by other people. He is not alone, but he is lonely. However, Adam the first, as Adam the first, does not recognize that he is lonely. He is too busy creating things, figuring out how the world works and mastering it for the sake of human progress. But other questions remain that pass over Adam the first unawares. To be human is not simply to ask what we can accomplish as a society, it is also to ask who we are at the root of our existence. To be human is not just about partnering with other humans to achieve common purposes, it is also to recognize that at the core of one's being, one is lonely. Here is where Adam the second comes into the picture. The second chapter of the book of Genesis offers another narration of the creation of man. There, God forms man from the dust of the ground and breathes the spirit of life into his nostrils, making man a living soul. God then sends man to the Garden of Eden to be its keeper. However, according to this version of the creation story, man is lonely in spite of all the other creatures around him. And so God creates woman, Eve, from Adam's rib to be his companion. Here, in contrast to the first narration, Adam is not created to subdue the earth, but to live in companionship with one like him, Eve. As a result, Adam II does not view the universe as an impersonal force to be mastered. Like Abraham, whom Soloveitchik calls the knight of faith and echo of Kierkegaard, Adam II does not find consolation in a silent companionship with the God whose power is reflected in the stars. Indeed, Adam II finds himself to be lonely as he gazes out at the impersonal world around him. He desires companionship with the very grounding of his existence, not in any silent or impersonal way as he might when gazing at the stars and wondering about the power that made them. Rather, he desires companionship with the very grounding of his existence as friend. This is something we all know. We've all had those moments when we look out at the world around us and feel ourselves to be radically separate from it. Lonely. But we also know the experience of friendship, where one is not simply a speck in the universe, but a person. This side of our existence, Adam II, desires a reciprocal gaze. A gaze not just from anyone, but from the very source of our existence. This side of our existence desires intimate companionship with God. 
with the God who speaks to us through prophecy and whom we stand before and address in prayer. No other gaze can effectively speak to us in our essential loneliness and draw us beyond our loneliness into existential community. But how does this all work? For Soloveitchik, it is not simply about man communing with God. It is worth remembering from Halakhic man that for Soloveitchik, the Jew lives grounded in this world and approaches it with ethical purposefulness. In his view, God is not a being beyond the realm of human experience, but is intimately bound up with what humans do as humans. Here, Eve has a vital role to play, and one very different from her relation to Adam I. For Adam II, Eve exists not as a partner in a social contract to bring about a better world. Eve is, rather, existential companion in a covenant of communion. Here, man and woman come together not for any utilitarian purpose, but as companions whose companionship works to redeem them from their existential loneliness. Adam I also lives in community and even has religion, but his is a majestic community that exists for utilitarian purposes. The same is true when Adam I comes together in religious community. It is not to stand helplessly before God, but rather to see what worldly interests being a member of a religious community might serve. It is very much mercantile religion. It is to join a religious community to be part of a productive group rather than to do so out of recognition of the invincible loneliness that constitutes one's existence. Adam II is different from all this. His community is not about doing, it is about being. It is not the majestic community, but rather the covenantal community. It is a community of people who, like Adam II, feel lonely and overcome by the very grounding of their existence. In the second narration of man's creation, it says that the eternal God caused an overpowering sleep to fall upon man. As a result of our experience of being existentially overpowered, we look for existential companionship with God, but we do so in this world through our companionship with others in a community that is based on a covenant, not of production, but of commitment. Here, then, the element of sacrifice is fundamental to the covenantal community. Sacrifice for others and sacrifice for God in the form of ethical commitment. The covenantal community is not simply a spiritual community hoping to experience some sense of transcendence. It is an ethical community. As Adam sacrificed a rib so that Eve might come into being, so community is fashioned for Adam II not through purely utilitarian and thus ultimately egoistic motives, but through sacrificial gestures of commitment. As Soloveitchik puts it, the companionship which Adam II is searching is not to be found in the depersonalized regimentation of the army, in the automatic coordination of the assembly line, or in the activity of the institutionalized, soulless political community. His quest is for a new kind of fellowship, which one finds in the existential community. There, not only hands are joined, but experiences as well. There, one hears not only the rhythmic sound of the production line, but also the rhythmic beat of hearts starved for existential companionship and all-embracing sympathy and experiencing the grandeur of the faith commitment. There, one lonely soul finds another soul, tormented by loneliness and solitude, yet unqualifiedly committed. All of this represents for Soloveitchik the redemption of humanity. Here, of course, the redemption that he has in mind is not quite redemption in the biblical sense, redemption from sinfulness, but rather redemption from the existential loneliness at the core of one's being. In the Bible, the concept of redemption is tied to the status of the Israelites as God's chosen people, as a people in covenant with God. The concept of being God's chosen people is not always easily understood. At heart, the idea of being God's chosen people goes hand in hand with the notion of eternal covenant. The Bible depicts God's people as generally recalcitrant and wayward, and yet God is always moved to redeem them. He could destroy them, and sometimes the Bible suggests that he plans to do so. Isn't that what a sinful people deserves? But in the end, God always relents, and instead of destroying his people, opts instead to redeem them and renew the covenant, to restore them to him in a new way despite their faults and failings. In the Bible, the people are chosen because the covenant is eternal. The two concepts go together. If the people were not chosen to be God's people, there would be no eternal covenant. And if there were no eternal covenant, the idea of being God's people would be a precarious venture with no lasting guarantee. However, for Soloveitchik, the scholar of Torah who is also deeply immersed in the currents of modern philosophy, redemption is something a bit different. It is redemption not from one's sinfulness and potential destruction at the hands of a wrathful God. It is redemption from loneliness. It is about being connected to a community of covenant where God, the very grounding of one's existence, is also a member. It is about being in intimate relation with God, not so much redemption of a chosen people that has gone astray, but redemption of humanity from its existential condition of loneliness.
In sum, the human face is an ontological dilemma that for Soloveitchik has become intensified in the modern age with its exclusive emphasis on man as productive. Indeed, the modernist assumption is that Adam the first is the totality of the human condition, that Adam the first and Adam the first alone is what it means to be human, to know how the world works and to master it, to cooperate in society, to conquer the forces of nature. But Soloveitchik insists there is another side to being human, for Adam II, to be human means not simply to ask how the world works, but to ask about the soul. What is it in relation to? This question is forced by recognition of one's loneliness. Adam II sees this, not Adam I. It is in his loneliness, in recognizing the impersonal character of existence, that Adam II realizes his own existential helplessness. He thus needs to be redeemed through union, but it cannot be any kind of union. It cannot be about Adam and Eve coming together to build a bridge or to launch a rocket into space. Here, Adam and Eve come together in covenant with God, a commitment and readiness to sacrifice for the other, not just networking for joint production, but a willingness to sacrifice for others through ethical action as signaled by the halakha. Religion for Adam the first is mercantile. For Adam the second, it is sacrificial. As Soloveitchik puts it, the foundation of efficacious and noble prayer is human solidarity and sympathy of the covenantal awareness of existential togetherness, of sharing and experiencing the travail and suffering of those for whom majestic Adam I has no concern. It is worth stating that for Soloveitchik and the covenantal community, one enters into committed communion with the divine other, but also with the human other. Indeed, the two are never quite separable. Adam I was created along with Eve. They simply came into being in partnership. But Adam II was introduced to Eve by God, who called the two to come together in existential community with him. As Soloveitchik puts it, if God had not joined the community of Adam and Eve, they would have never been able and would have never cared to make the paradoxical leap over the gap, indeed abyss, separating two individuals whose personal and experiential messages are written in a private code undecipherable by anyone else. Thus, God is never outside the covenantal community. In the majestic community, he is all-powerful but impersonal force. In the covenantal community, he is friend. Soloveitchik has painted a brilliant theo-humanistic picture for us. He begins from our own existential state and ends with a community in prayer before God. It is not something demanded from on high. It's just what it means to be human. Soloveitchik knew what it is to be lonely. He also knew what it means to be a lonely man of faith. It is not about holding on to a thought of God in one's head. It means acting, praying with others and sacrificing for them. Ironically, all of this, our very redemption, is not dictated to us by tradition, but is rather driven by the promptings of our own existential condition, in this most modern and perhaps also loneliest of all ages. Thank you.